Welcome to our first in a series of lessons about the topic of blue booking. This session is going to be relatively short and it's going to cover aspects of blue booking that we've already covered in the course, but it has been a few weeks since we've physically been together, so I thought that I would refresh everyone on what we've already covered before we dive into new stuff. So this one should be a review. Um, you'll see here that we have our canvas set up and I'm going to go down to module 10 which is where I have the blue book and the green book stuff. You'll see the last two items are Westlaw items. Obviously um, they are not going to be focusing on blue booking stuff. So we have a list of six items in addition to your blue book and your green book of course. And I've put a little period after the items that are going to be most helpful for you. This is the PowerPoint that we're using today. And then this is the handout that I gave in class that goes through kind of a cheat sheet about blue booking and green booking. This last item we're not going to get to today, but as we progress, this will, I think, prove to be very, very helpful. Um, the other items may be helpful for you. Um, they're less important. But um, sometimes hearing something from a different perspective or reading something in a different perspective can be helpful. So I wanted to give some additional resources. I'm going to now go to our uh, PowerPoint. You will see this same PowerPoint uh, posted. It will say Unit 8 when you go into it. I've moved units around over time. Uh, the content is all accurate. It's just the, uh, the unit numbers vary as I uh, redesign the course from time to time. So let's get started. Um, there's lots of places that you can get information. I just showed you the most important ones from Canvas. Your textbook also covers uh, blue booking to some extent. Um, and so those are some places to look. And then of course your notes from previous classes can be helpful. And obviously your notes from this and future lectures. Um, it's a good idea to take careful notes as we're watching. A nice thing about watching a video is that you can stop me, and rewind and hear what I say again if I'm not that clear. Um, and that's a good idea. Um, if you don't take careful notes, what you're dooming yourself to is watching the video several times. Uh, taking careful notes one time can uh, really reduce the need of listening to something multiple times. So it takes a little longer the first time, but it end, ends up saving you a lot of time in the end. At least that's uh, the potential for uh, taking careful notes now. So let's go forward. Uh, the textbook talks a lot about all wood as a resource. I put it in brackets here because when you're reading the textbook, you may get the impression that all wood is this really important thing in the legal community. It's not. I'm not sure why this textbook is so in love with all wood. Please disregard all that stuff. That's not what we do in Texas at all. I don't know of any place that uses this all wood approach. The only books you need to know about are the blue book and the green book. And so I'm not going to ask you any test questions about all wood. So um, I've already covered this, but just a very brief summary as to why we care about blue booking. The first is that um, it helps the reader find what you're referencing. I mean, this is the reason that we use MLA or Turabian or APA or whatever type of citation tool that you use in your English, your history, or whatever courses. It's so the reader can find what you're citing and confirm that the information is accurate and current um, and, and all that good stuff. So that's I guess in some sense perhaps the most important task of blue booking. Um, but that's only one of the tasks. Another important task is um, to see how much weight this particular article or this particular case ought to be given. If I cite the case Smith versus Brown um, and say, oh, this, this is how the court should rule in a particular case. Well, the court's going to want to know, is this a Texas case? Is this a recent case? Um, how can I find the case so I can read it myself? And so it's more than just the location of the case. It's also where the case was decided, when the case was decided. And so it helps the reader immediately tell the precedential value of the case. And legal readers do read uh, that information carefully to figure out, hey, is this a case that is important and that I have to pay attention to, or is it a case that isn't so important? 
The third reason that we care about citations, I guess, is reputational. Um, law firms really differ about this in my experience. And the larger the law firm, um, the more likely they are to care passionately about correct blue book formatting. And the argument that they would advance as to why it's important is, of course, of course, the first two reasons that we just talked about. But the third reason is that legal writers, excuse me, legal readers are going to take a legal writer who does careful blue booking much more seriously. The idea is, gosh, why would you take a legal writer who can't be bothered to blue book correctly? Why would you take him or her seriously about the legal arguments he or she is advancing? Um, it communicate careful blue booking communicates a seriousness and attention to detail, uh, a respect and concern for the reader. And so uh, many law firms take the view that a meticulous blue booking is important. Otherwise, the idea is, well, sloppiness, the, the reader's going to say, well, that person was sloppy about blue book formatting. Perhaps they are sloppy, that the legal writer is sloppy about other things. There are other law firms, and many times these are smaller law firms, that take the view of, eh, it's nice to get it right blue book wise, but I'm not going to be up late at night worrying about it. Um, whichever firm you're in kind of gives you your direction as to how to approach this. Um, it's never, you're never going to be faulted for blue booking correctly, but um, some law firms care about it more than others. So that's a good thing to kind of get the temperature uh, of the individuals who work in your, in your law firm, see what's important and what's not. For our class, we aren't going to get into the weeds. Um, we're taking more of the I guess blase approach you could say. I'm going to teach you how to blue book your standard citation, but we're putting the bar very, very low. I do that because many law firms do have a low bar. Just know I'm setting it about the lowest you can imagine. Um, virtually every law firm is going to say, well, at least you have to do that much. And so um, don't be surprised if you go to work for a law firm and they really want you to do quite a bit more. Um, I, uh, I, I guess that one reason why I set the bar relatively low is that there are so many details that if I teach you uh, 200 details, you're not going to remember any of them. But if I focus on teaching you the 20 most important details, there's a pretty good chance you'll remember 15 of them. And so the idea is that hopefully more of it will stick so you'll have kind of a mental framework to think about. Anyway, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, when I first started learning blue booking, um, it was very much, very important to communicate very clearly that I had to get every single detail right. And it was a feeling of being overwhelmed. And I don't want you to go through that. It's an important part of the practice of law, but it's not the only important part. And in fact, it's not nearly as important ultimately as you know, representing your client effectively in terms of the content of your arguments. As I said before, you don't need to know anything about Allwood. As you can tell, the Blue Book got its name from the Blue Book. Um, the official name of it, especially when I went to law school, they didn't even have the word Blue Book on the cover. It was just called a Uniform System of Citation. If you were to ask a hundred attorneys uh, what's the system of citation that you use? 99 would say Blue Book. Um, but if you were to tell them what's the official name of the Blue Book, um, unless they were on law review in law school, they probably don't remember. It's called the Uniform System of Citation. So definitely Blue Book is the way to refer to it. The Blue Book is a um, book that is published by um, several law reviews, and again, law reviews are student groups. There, I don't, as far as I know, there's not any faculty associated with it. Anyway, all these law schools have kind of their best and brightest students work on, which is essentially a scholarly magazine, um, and virtually all uh, law schools have them. Many law schools have multiple journals. Usually the most prestigious is called something like the, whatever the name of the law school is, Law Review. Um, uh, there can be some other names associated with it, you know, Yale Law Review or something along those lines, Georgetown Law Review, but sometimes they have other names. And then there may be other law reviews that the, or law journals that the particular law, uh, law school uses um, on a particular topic. They may have them on, for example, environmental law or um, uh, gender law or 
um, animal rights law or something along those lines um, that focuses on a particular topic. Anyway, the most prestigious law schools, uh, the most prestigious students get on the law review and then the law reviews and the most prestigious law schools kind of got together and set up the blue book um, as their system of citation. It is pretty much the only game in town. Um, the University of Chicago, which is a very, very good law school, um, went its own way. It decided not to be part of that consortium. And it established a book called the Maroon Book. And so if you practice in the state of Illinois, there's a pretty good chance that you will use the Maroon Book instead of the Blue Book. But other than that part of the country, pretty much everywhere else it's the Blue Book. Uh, putting citations into blue book format is called blue booking. Um, this is um, not the most common current citation. It's 20. So it's a little bit out of date. I apologize for that. You don't, for this course, need the most recent edition of the blue book. The 19 would be just fine. You do need the most recent edition for the green book. We'll talk about that in a second. As we talked about in class, the Blue Book is kind of a weird book. 99% of the users of the Blue Book are people who are using it for the practice of law. But um, for the people who are, uh, for the people who are, um, excuse me, I apologize for that. For the, for the 1% though, they are the people who actually um, publish law review articles or write law review articles. So you would think, well, gosh, you would focus on your main audience, the 99%, uh, the attorneys, the paralegals, the judges, the law clerks. Uh, but no, um, the book is really set up for the writers of law review articles, and the rest of us are kind of afterthoughts. Kind of a weird situation, but um, that's just the reality of the world. And so you'll see large parts of the book um, actually either aren't helpful to what you want to do or they will give you bad advice. Um, here's an example of how you do things differently if you are writing a law review article versus if you are writing a, an article for, or not an article, but say a brief in a case. So this is the law review version. You can see they use small caps. And then here we just use a lowercase letters. The reason for the difference is historic. Once upon a time, uh, law, profess law professionals like you and me would be typing these documents or having our legal secretary type these documents. Well, it wasn't possible on traditional typewriters to do a, um, a small cap. But of course, law review articles were printed, they were typeset, and so small caps weren't a big deal. And so this style was much more practical for the law review audience to use. And this version right here, was the one that law firms could easily produce. And so this was the distinction that was made. You can see another distinction is that this is not italicized or underlined, whereas it is italicized here. So there's some other differences. Um, for the most part, if you stumble into the law review portion of the book, um, it's gonna be okay. Just the main thing to remember is ignore small caps. You don't have to worry about those. That's probably the biggest difference. So um, it is a thick book. I'm, I apologize, it is intimidating when you first see it. Um, the back cover, and when you, know, when you turn to the back, that is the easiest and most, um, most common types of citations. And I would say that when I'm using the Blue Book, that is my first place to go. Um, they're very uh, logically organized and you can be very successful, especially if you have some understanding about how blue booking goes. This can be a very good refresher. And you can see on the back section, if you happen to have yours handy, you may want to pull it out, is that it talks about cases and it talks about rule 10 and it talks about blue pages B10. And then it gives you, I guess, about seven or eight a citation example showing you how to set those up. Um, there aren't any from Texas here, as you can see, but um, a good one to look at would be the second one, Herrick versus Lindley. That's a very good example of how we would do things in Texas. The only differences really would be that instead of using the Northeastern Reporter, we would use the Southwestern Reporter. 
So you would change the N and the E to an S and a W. And then obviously you would change Ohio, which doesn't get abbreviated um, in Blue Book World, to a TEX period. And the rest of it would be just fine. So that would be a good example of one to kind of put a little mark to. And you might even want to write out an example that would be pure Texas from that perspective. You can go down a little farther and see a section on statutes. The Blue Book is most helpful in terms of statutes when you're doing federal statutes or statutes from other states. The Green Book really shines when we're talking about Texas statutes. So um, while the general rule is we, we Blue Book everything first and then we go back and add the final touches of Green Booking, I'll be honest with you when I'm doing statutes, when I'm doing cases, I do Blue Book first and Green Book. But when I'm doing statutes, I focus upon the Green Book. Then the next section to look at, if you don't get your answer to your question by looking at the back, is to look at the kind of the baby blue pages. Um, they're the ones that have a B in front of the page number. And they're at the very front of the book. And you can see there's about, let's see how many pages there are there. Um, there's about, there's two sections here um, but there's about I guess 60 pages ish in this section uh, so it's a, a relatively manageable number of pages um, so it, it's relatively short but it's not the case that you can say oh well that's all I need to know no um, you still do need to go to both the white page section which is the section after uh, the baby blue pages and then the dark uh, blue section. I would, the dark blue section is the table section where you find things like abbreviations and things along those lines. So while um, you'll be using the, the baby blues most, it, it's, it's still the case that you will need the other sections of the book from time to time. Okay, so the green book. The green book has kind of a, a four screen. It used to have more of a four screen. It's now more of a, a brighter green than it once was. Um, the edition that we're on right now is the 14th edition, and I do recommend that you use the 14th edition. If you don't have it, that's okay, but there are two kind of big changes that happened with the 14th edition, and we'll talk about those as we get to those particular topics. Uh, for today's lecture, we're really not going to do any green booking. I'm just going to kind of introduce you to the book. So as I said before, we do blue booking first. We get every all aspects of it blue booked. Uh, as correctly as we can and then we add the final touches to green booking and we only green book if we're in the state of Texas if we are in Oklahoma or appearing before an Oklahoma judge um, we wouldn't uh, uh, green book if you are in federal court in the state of Texas you will green book um, so kind of really it's a matter of what side of the Red River you're on or what side of the Sabine you're on in terms of whether you're going to use green booking or not uh, green booking, as I said before, doesn't replace blue booking. It does some specific things that are required in Texas that the blue book just doesn't respond to one way or the other. I have some pages here from this third, 13th edition that are the ones that are going to be most important for green booking. Since the 14th edition is currently out, these page numbers aren't going to be exactly correct, but they'll be pretty close. And as we uh, progress um, into the other sessions, you'll uh, be able to, to tweak the page numbers that may be more relevant. Okay, this is a weird thing. I don't have an excuse for this, legal professionals, for whatever reason, this is just a continuing problem. Judicial opinions routinely are not in correct blue book format. The reason, I think, is that judges don't really have to impress anyone. Um, they uh, probably were experts at blue booking at some point in their career and now they're judges and honestly nobody can fire them or at least if they're they're appointed into the federal bench they can't be fired if they're elected judges the electorate isn't going to kick them out because they don't blue book correctly obviously so um, there gets to be a fair amount of sloppiness so you can't just trust the way a court has written its opinion to say, ah, well, that must be the correct blue book form. Not at all. I mean, there are judges who care and get it right, but you can't count on them being in correct format. 
Another odd thing is that if you look at, if you actually go to the stacks of a legal library and pull a book off the shelf, many times at the top, they will say, this is how you should cite our book. The only problem with that system is I've never seen it so that the way the author, the, the, the publishers of that book say that their book should be cited is the way the blue book says it ought to be cited. There's never, I've never seen a time where they actually match. And so if I see that they indicate a way of citation, I almost always think to myself, well, I'm definitely not using that because there's a very small chance that will be right. Um, so disregard that if you happen to be flipping through a book. I use the blue book citation. Don't assume, even though it would have been a logical assumption, but don't assume that the publishers have blue booked their, their publication before they post that. So that's a little bit of a caveat there. Okay, so we're going to go through and um, set up uh, some blue booking right now. In my experience, the way to learn to blue book is to blue book. Um, so don't just watch. Go ahead and get Word open and play around with your blue booking so that you can uh, know what's going on and you can have that experience. And of course, you can bring questions to class to our uh, uh, virtual class so that you can um, uh, figure out the, the questions that you need to know the answer to. So first thing to know is, of course, the style or the name of the case, you're either going to italicize or you're going to underline. Both are fine, but you can't do both. You can't italicize and underline. And you have to be consistent. If you italicize one case, one style of a case, you have to do that for all the cases in that particular document. If you underline, you ought to underline all of them in that particular document. I think most legal scholars pick one or the other approach and stick with it. You may find that the attorney with whom you work has a preference and you stick with that. Um, although both are completely correct, definitely the trend is toward italici italicizing. Um, underlining, of course, was much easier back in the days of typewriters because literally the legal secretary would type it as normal, then she would go back and underline it. Well, uh, she wouldn't have been able to italicize without uh, changing the head on her typewriter. And so italic italicization was <laughs> uh, very difficult to do. And so underlining was the, the usual method. Um, nowadays, um, because we have word processing, we can italicize very easily. Also, when you people are looking on documents on, online and see a, something is underlined, they oftentimes think that it is an active link, and so that can cause problems. So I think the trend is toward it, uh, using italics, but again, you can use whatever you want to. But I would pick one and stick with that. I don't care which one you use for this class. Again, if you're submitting assignment, do it all one way but either way is fine. Um, we will, I'll show you one other advantage to italici tal italicizing in a couple of minutes. When you are uh, formatting the name of your case, the style of your case, you need to be careful to follow the Blue Book abbreviation rules. Um, in the 20th edition, you're going to find the abbreviation rules. Um, let me go ahead and find it. It is on page 496. It's called T6, Case Names and Institutional Authors and Citations. You will need to use those abbreviations. So for example, if you're not sure what the abbreviation for corporation is, you might be tempted just to write out corporation every time. Surely you can do that. It would be lovely if you could, but the rules are you have to follow the Blue Book citation. So if there is an abbreviation, in this case there is, you need to use it. Also, Blue Book has some abbreviations that might be unexpected, things that you wouldn't ordinarily expect either would be abbreviated at all or would be abbreviated in the way that they abbreviate. So it's a good practice to check um, the case names uh, of a uh, uh, for, you know, even if you're thinking, oh, that probably doesn't have a, a blue book abbreviation, um, you may be surprised to see that it does. Um, it's pretty common for blue book abbreviations to use that apostrophe in the middle. If it has an apostrophe in the middle, it means that the original word, some of the letters have been taken out of the middle. 
and, and what Blue Book has done is a place those missing letters with an apostrophe. It's kind of like what we do when we write a contraction. You know, if we're writing I'd, I'd have gone with you if I could have. Well, what that's an abbreviation for in this context is the word I would. And what I literally did was I got rid of the W-O-U-L and I replaced all of that with the apostrophe. So, and when, of course, when we write this, even though in some sense it's an abbreviation, we don't put a period at the end. Well, Blue Book follows that same pattern. So, for example, if we have association, we're going to do apostrophe N, no period at the end. So I'm going to put a little X there. But if I'm doing corporation, since the letters I'm removing are at the end of the word, I'm just going to put a period. So, um, again, you can just look it up in the table. You don't have to memorize that. But knowing that's the logic behind it can, can sometimes make it easier to apply the rules. Some businesses or other names start with the word the, as in the May Company. Y'all may not be familiar with that name, but or maybe the Colony in Texas. If it starts with a the, you lop that off and just go with May Company. The most common style is to have the, the name of, of, a, of a human being, Bob Smith, and the name of another human being, uh, Jerry Green. And you uh, uh, take the last name of the human being versus the last name of the human being. If you have Bob Smith and Teresa Brown versus um, Juan Davis and uh, Jose uh, Riviera, um, you would just keep the first names. I can't remember what the names are I used, but maybe Smith versus Brown. The ordering of the names is largely random. I mean, the plaintiff gets to establish it because he establishes the a caption of the case. Um, and so he may choose to order them in a certain way, but uh, really it's, it's, not, it's not important which name comes first or whatever. But when you're, when you're writing the style of the case, you do pick just that first name in the style for the plaintiff and just the first name in the style for the uh, defendant. So human beings' names are pretty easy to do. Businesses' names can be a little bit more tricky though. You don't lop off parts of the name, except of course for the the, that you do lop off. So here I have ABC Incorporated. We're gonna keep all parts of that here. We're gonna abbreviate Incorporated according to the rules. Let's say you had a business that is, let's say it's Bob Smith Companies Incorporated. Do you keep the Bob? If it were Bob Smith, just the human being, obviously you would cut off the Bob and go with Smith. But when you have somebody's name, his first and last name in the name of the business, you keep both the first and the last name. Okay, so we've talked about reporters. Here are a list of the most common reporters that we work with in this class. We have the Southwestern Reporter, which reports all Texas state cases that get published. So these are cases originating in Texas that are in our state court system. The first reporter, and you'll very rarely see cases that you are actually going to be using uh, that is from this reporter, because these cases are quite old. Um, it'll just be capital S period, capital W period, no space. I mean, a space before and a space after, but no space in the middle. You will see Southwestern second fairly often. Those aren't super, super old. And again, capital S period, capital W period, 2D. No N here, just a 2D. And again, no space here, no space here. Yes, a space before and a space after, but none in the middle. And now we happen to have Southwestern Reporter third. So you would just change the two to a three. No R here, just 3D. And there's no period, whether it's a 2D or 3D, there's no period here and no spaces. Then we have the federal reporter, same pattern. F period, just for the first federal reporter. The second edition would be F period 2D. The third edition be F period 3D. No spaces in the middle here. Federal supplement is the first one in which we do have spaces. And you can see we have a space here and a space here. 
I think the reason that we have spaces is because this is um, not just a single letter, but I'm not sure about that. I've never officially heard the rule, uh, but you do need spaces um, here. Um, if it's fed sup, just um, or F sup, F period space, capital S U P P period space. Obviously, you wouldn't have this if it were the first edition. I'm not sure if they're on third series or not. So these are the formats for these particular documents. So um, after you have the case name, green versus brown, we're going to use the comma. Use a comma after the case name, but the comma should not be underlined or italicized. This is one of the reasons that people prefer italics um, because it's very hard to tell whether a comma is italicized or not. So if you forget and accidentally italicize the comma, I mean, really, who's going to notice? But if you underline a comma, it's pretty obvious it's underlined. And so it, it does uh, kind of detract a little bit from the pristineness of your blue booking citation. So that's yet another reason. Now for this class, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to check to see if you italicized your, your comma. So you're not going to get away with anything here, but just life in general, you can probably get away with uh, comma errors in that regard more commonly than if you were um, uh, using the underlining. So then we're going to have a space blank. Now we're going to use the volume. You can see here we go through step by step. Space and normal type, write the volume number. So let's say the volume is 213, the 213th volume. Then we're going to do another space. And let's say we're in the Southwest Reporter 3rd edition. So S period W period 3 D, no period, space. And now we're going, oops, sorry. And now we are going to, in normal type, add the first page number of the opinion. This is where the opinion begins. So we're going to say the case starts on page 419. there's a space between the reporter and the and the first page of the opinion you always give this even if no part of the actual opinion appears on that first page and in most cases there won't be any part of the actual opinion that appears we have a comma then we're going to have one more space and we may well have a pinpoint citation And this is the page or pages that you're actually focusing the attention of the reader on. Um, we're going to pretend that the page that we care about is page 422. We write out the whole number. And this can sometimes be a four digit number. We see it can be a one, two, three, or four digit number. This number is always going to be greater than this number or rarely the same. It can never be less because it could be such that um, the actual opinion actually starts on that first page. It's not common for that to happen because there's all of that information that the Westlaw people add to the opinion which usually pushes the first line of the opinion onto at least the second page. But it could be that it's it's so uh, such a brief opinion that there's not a lot of stuff to say up front and so it could be 419 comma space 419 but in this case we're we're address, we're focusing the reader's attention to page 422 this is what we call a pinpoint site you don't have to have a pinpoint site so as you might be drawing the reader's attention to the whole opinion and in that case you don't even have this. After the 419, you have a space and then you're done with the next part of the opinion, which we're not going to get to today. But here we're going to have a pinpoint site. If it's just one page, then we're done. We have a space, we're done with the opinion. But let's imagine that the, the paragraph that we want the reader to focus on actually appears on two pages. So we're going to do a dash. And then we're just going to write the last two 
pages 23. Bore 22 to 23. You can't just put a 3 here and you can't put 423. You just use the last two digits and then you put another space. This is as far as we have gone in the case, excuse me, the class so far. We will go on and uh, make progress on the other parts of the decision later on. You may recall that when we started um, uh, doing blue book stuff, I talked about the four W's. We have the what, which is the name of the case. We have the where, which is the volume and the reporter. And those are the two parts of the uh, blue booking that we've done. What we have yet to do is the who and the when. Let me just put the when in here. So we can kind of put a check by this, a check by this, who and when are coming attractions. Now we're going to play around with some of these concepts. So let's go through some examples. You know, so I have it in Times New Roman 12 point font. That's the way to approach these. Another thing I recommend when you're using Word is to go ahead and I'm on the home section right here. Go over and hit this because this will show you your formatting. So let's just get started with, um, so we know that um, Bob Smith is suing Jerry P Peterson. And we know that the case is, um, case is reported in volume 548 of Southwestern Reporter second edition beginning on page 512 but we want the reader to focus on 515 and 516. Okay, so we have all the information we need for those first two questions, what and where. Actually, let's make it a little more complicated. Let's say Bob Smith and Teresa Harris are suing Jerry Peterson and Miranda Gomez. Okay. So these are our uh, plaintiffs, or at least the first names in the style of the case. So we know that we're just going to pay attention to the first name. So I'm just going to draw a line through Teresa Harris. Then we have Jerry Peterson and Miranda Gomez. Similar thing here, just the first name is the only one we care about for the style purpose. Now we're going to look, Bob Smith is going to be what's going to appear on the left side of the V, but we don't need the first name of Bob Smith, so I'm going to make that go away. Similarly, we're going to make Jerry go away as well. So we have our style set up now. It's Smith versus Peterson. You can see that the V is lowercase and it's a, just a period. We don't do that. That's wrong. We just do a V period. And now we're going to put a comma. If you put the comma first, it's easier to avoid italicizing the comma or underlining it. I can underline it. You can see how that looks. I can make the underlining go away and I can do italics. One of the nice things with the Times New Roman font is that the italics, uh, it makes it very obvious that it is italics. Let me just show you another font um, that doesn't show italics as clearly. We'll use um, Arial font. 
So I'm going to type Smith versus Peterson, comma. Let's type it again. And we're going to make, obviously, it's easy to see if it's underlined. That's not hard. But if I italicize this, it's not much different. And of course, the reason is that there uh, that, that Arial, Arial is a sans serif font. Um, there aren't any doodads on it. You don't have these little caps like you see on the S or you see at the, um, uh, you know, the letters, you know, there's little little foots at the bottom, feet, I'm sorry, I guess it's the more correct way to put the bottom of the M's. And so there's more of it, more distinctions between the um, un italicized font and the italicized font. The big difference here is simply that the letters are slightly tilted when we're looking at um, italics. So that's yet one more reason why you don't want to use a font like Arial in legal writing. You want to focus on, especially if you're going to use italics, but for this class, especially for blue booking purposes, Times New Roman is what we want to use. Um, virtually every word processing system will have that. You have access to um, um, Word 365, and so you can, you're welcome to use that to get everything set up. Okay, so we have our style of our case, and now we're going to look at our volume. Well, our volume is um, uh, 548. And you can see, because I had this backwards paragraph, every time I hit the space bar, I'm going to have this dot in the middle. If I make that go away, you can see the dot goes away. But that is very handy because if I accidentally put in extra dots, it may be hard to see that I have extra dots. But it becomes a lot easier to see that way. So. It's a very helpful tool. I actually use that to grade this assignment. So um, I will turn on that backwards paragraph sign uh, to see if there's extra uh, spaces or things along those lines. So now we're going to go with, well, I guess I got rid of, I uh, can't remember what the volume that I said was. 549 is what we'll go with. It may not be what I said earlier, I apologize. So we're going to type in 549. We don't do any kind of TH deal. We just do 549 and then space. We're going to do S, capital S period, capital W period, 2D. We aren't going to do 2ND. Um, and now we're going to do a space. And then we'll have that first page, 912, excuse me, 512. And then a space, a comma, space again. And now we're going to do our pinpoint citation, which is going to be 515 dash, five, excuse me, 16. You don't want there to be any spaces, so don't put a space there. Um, and you just need one, uh, one dash, what's called an N dash. And an N dash happens when, if you look on your keyboard to the right of your um, uh, zero sign, you hit, I'm sorry, to the right of the zero sign, you do not shift, you hit it once. Um, it is between the equal sign and the um, zero sign. Uh, so just hit that once and that gives you what's called an N dash. In a later lecture, we'll talk about the M dash, but today we don't need to worry about that. Okay, now let's um, imagine that it is a corporation here. So um, we're going to have um, Juan Garcia um, and Natalie Cook are suing Ford Motor Company. It'd be lovely if I could spell. And um, Bob's Brake Repair 
Company Incorporated. And we're going to pretend that these are the legal names of these entities. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is look at one side. This is the plaintiff side, we'll say. And then we have the defendant side. So we have two names. The second name we're going to cut out. And again, if it had been listed Natalie Cook versus Juan Garcia, then we'd be cutting Juan out. But we're going to cut Natalie because her name is second. Then we're cutting Juan's first name off. And so we'll have Garcia versus, and now again, we're gonna cut off Bob's Break Repair Incorporated, because it's the second name. And we're gonna go with Ford. Now I'm gonna check some abbreviations. So I'm gonna go to that page 496. I'm going to look and see if motor is abbreviated. And it doesn't look like motor is. So I'm going to um, write out the whole word motor. See, so I'm going to put a space there, though. And then I'm going to look under company. And um, company is actually abbreviated the way we would expect it to be abbreviated, which is lovely. Company, period, comma. We do keep the period even though it's right before a comma. Um, sometimes it won't want you, it will, you know, make the, the comma, I guess it's the, the period that's causing the difficulty. So sometimes you actually have to go through and italicize or underline everything and then go back and unitalicize. So now that comma is unitalicized. This is what it looks like when it is italicized. It's a pretty subtle difference, but again, I'll be checking. So at least for the purpose of this assignment, I'll make sure that you're doing it correctly. And so we have the style. Obviously doing the rest of it is just your usual way of um, doing it. Let's go into um, Westlaw for a second so we can, uh, play around with um, see if it has my right password. <laughs> it's looking promising. Okay. Hit agree. This is the client that I'm choosing for this assignment. Okay, I'm going to go into um, how we got into dockets. I'm going to go to home base and I'm just going to type in Sheshinov. This is the Texas Supreme Court opinion. So if, if I am presented, so what I oftentimes do on assignments is I will give everyone in the class this information. Oftentimes I will cut, I'll take a screenshot of this and cut and paste something like this so you can see all the information. So what I'm going to do is take this, because this is all I need right now, copy. And I'm going to plop it in to here. Okay, and so I actually don't need, I will need the court information later on, but right now I don't need it. So I'm going to take this and put it at the tail end, cut, paste. Okay, so this is somebody's names, Alex Sheshinoff Management Services LP. If it were just Alex Sheshinoff versus Kevin jo Kev uh, Kenneth Johnson, I would cut off Alex and go with Sheshinoff versus Johnson. But this is actually the name of the business. So all I have to remove here is the party designation and then the comma. We don't put a comma right before the V. 
And then I'm going to get rid of Kenneth's first name. And I'm going to get rid of the second party. There was no second party in on the, uh, the first name side. So here we go. Then I'm going to just have um, Microsoft Word only use caps for first capitalize each word. We have to do it twice. Here we go. And I'm going to have to go back and uncapitalize the V. And I'm going to get rid of respondents. So I was able to format this pretty pretty quickly. If there are little words, like let's say it was Alex Sheshinoff Management and Accounting Services, I would want to go through and make the and lowercase. So sometimes you have to tweak if you do that the trick with making every capitalize every word. Sometimes the small words aren't supposed to be capitalized. Now I'm going to look in blue booking and see obviously Alex Sheshinoff we don't have to do anything with, but management may have an abbreviation. And I see that it does. I'm on page 493. So I'm going to adopt the abbreviation, which is capital M-G-M-T. Even though they are removing letters in the middle of the word, they are choosing not to use the um, apostrophe. And so there is going to be a period at the end. Now I'm going to see if services is and they say service so um, I would have to do a bit more of a dive to see whether I should change services to, to the abbreviation they have for service but I'm just going to leave it there for now um, if you have an assignment um, that is ambiguous like that send me an email I don't intend to create um, any point of confusion with that. Then we have LP and of course we have Johnson. Actually I should have gotten rid of the LP because the LP related to the other business. Okay so it looks like this is a good abbreviation here and we have the volume of our reporter, the uh, reporter itself, and we have the first page of the opinion. Let's go look here. So this page is page 644 of the reporter. Let's scroll down to see where we get to page 645. Sometimes it can be a little bit hard to see. Ah, here we go, 646. So you'll see that they'll have a little asterisk and then they'll have the new page, 646. So you can see for this particular opinion, we would never have a pinpoint site for page 645 because the opinion doesn't even start until page 646. And the opinion starts pretty close to the top of page 646. Let's say though, as we scroll down, we really think this paragraph is super cool and this is what we wanna draw our reader's attention to. So we would have to find out, well, what page is that on? And so I'm gonna go back up here and we have, right here we have 646. And the page break can occur in the middle of a line. We can see 648 here, so I must've missed the 647. Sometimes, ah, here, 647, it's right here. So 648 is right here. So it looks like that the paragraph we're citing is going to be on 648. I always find the page after 649 is right here. So everything that we want is on page 648. So I can now add space comma 648. And actually, obviously, I'm going to need to unitalicize this. So we have a really nice citation for our reporter. I'm going to get rid of the backward paragraph symbols and this is how it would actually um, look in a nice published blue booking citation. Let's say that I wanted to cite these sentences right here. 
down to here? Well, it crosses from 648 to 649. So then I would right here do an N dash, N is in Nancy, and do a 49. And then I would do another space, and then we'd be ready for the next part, which we're not going to do. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. I appreciate your attention. And um, in subsequent lessons, we'll talk about the second half of the Blue Book Citation. And then we'll also talk about the green booking process. Please bring questions that you have to our um, uh, meeting times. And um, if you are a little reluctant to ask questions during those, email those, those questions to me beforehand. And I will be happy to um, answer them as, as we uh, talk through the issues. Thanks for your attention. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.